Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention? First of all, a very, very warm welcome to everyone here. We're in for a very exciting evening, and I much enjoy the title of Dr. Barbary's lecture, especially the word Floromania. I'm not quite sure if it's a real word, but he will explain it to us as we go along. I'd like, first of all, to thank SOAS very, very much for putting on this series of lectures which accompany the exhibition curated by Marion Bukhari. And if any of you haven't seen it, I would urge you very much to see it. It's on for another week or so, I believe, Marion. That's correct, isn't it? Yes, indeed. So have a look at the exhibition. And this is a series of lectures which is to accompany the exhibition. It's looking at various facets of things which you will see there. There is just one more lecture. This is actually the penultimate lecture. There is one next week, and it's by Ajmand Aziz. So I hope that you will be able to attend that as well. Just to introduce Dr. Saqib Barbary, I've known Saqib for a very, very long time. I'm actually a very old student of SOAS. I'm an alumni, more years than I care to remember. And Saqib, too, has been at SOAS. He did his PhD here on Shah Jahan. And he was then the Simon Digby Fellow for a couple of years, the first one from Simon's award, the Charitable Foundation. And now Saqib is working in the Persian Manuscripts Department at the British Library, so he's still very much within the sort of Bloomsbury circuit. And we will take questions afterwards, so I'm now going to hand the floor over to Saqib. And so sit back, enjoy, and be prepared to be stimulated. Thank you, Saqib. <laughs> Thanks, Rosie, for that very generous introduction. I just hope I can do it justice. Uh, I'd also like to echo your words by thanking Marion. Uh, Marion and I, we had a discussion just a few months before installation, uh, and I was amazed at her uh, ambitious timeline, if I may put it that way, uh, and even more so at her sense of mission, championing the history of women. Uh, as tastemakers, the patrons, the consumers, the producers of textiles, active at royal courts and all other registers of society. Uh, my own interest in the history, art and culture of the Timurid Empire and its later reincarnation as the so-called Mughal Empire in northern India immediately suggested a study of the continuities and divergences in the sartorial, textile, and decorative cultures of these empires in Iran and Central Asia, as well as in India. Therefore, my starting point for this evening's discussion will be to give a brief overview of the ornamental repertoire in the Timurid period that is widely termed the international Timurid style, before settling onto an exploration of the evolutionary trends in ornamental repertoire for the embellishment of textiles and other decorative arts, which I argue are evidence for the emergence of yet another reinvigorated form of the international Timurid style. The important point for me is to question whether synergies in ornamental repertoire always cut across the decorative arts to create a unified visual culture embracing the design of manuscripts, textiles, ceramics, architecture, and so on, or whether it is possible that different modes of ornamental repertoire coexist in parallel, but not cancelling each other out. The latter, uh, if, if it is the latter, where lies the divide between the different modes? And is there a policy behind these choices? But first, let's talk about the Timurids. The descendants of Amir Taymur, known to Europe as Tamerlane, uh, are known uh, to have ruled Iran, Syria, Anatolia to the west, and Central Asia and India in the east. They unified the patchwork of autonomous provinces ruled by warlords that once formed part 
of the Ilkhanid Empire that traced its origins to Genghis Khan. Taimur married into the last surviving branches of Genghis Khan's dynasty, the Chagatai Khans, and took on the important title of son-in-law, or Gur Khan, which lent the new ruler an air of legitimacy in the eyes of some ethnic Turks, Mongols, and other loyalists. Although Amir Taimur Gur Khan was himself peripatetic, that is, constantly moving from one place to another, wherever his military campaigns would lead, he established his family and locus of power around a cluster of cities in Central Asia, including Samarkand, Tashkand, Aksaray, and others, building major monuments, foundations, and patronizing the arts, but in absentia. This has already been discussed by other speakers as part of this series, including Susan Babai. The provinces were governed by Amir Taimur's sons and grandsons, peers of state and other vassals, some of whom were able to establish centers of excellence in the absence of the, um, sorry, uh, centers of excellence in the arts by the creation of relatively stable government and patronage. Amir Taimur died in 1405, and his empire was consumed by the internal competition between members of his family. Shah Rukh Mirza, uh, Amir Taimur's eldest son, suppressed his rivals and consolidated the, uh, sorry, not the eldest son, the eldest surviving son, uh, suppressed his uh, rivals and consolidated the empire that diminished in its extent and military potency incrementally over the uh, succession of two generations of rulers, Ulugh Beg Mirza and Baisunkur uh, Bai Mirza, who nevertheless created wealthy courts, vibrantly supporting the sciences, literature, and visual arts. The vassal Ottomans and Indian territories quickly resumed their former independence, while Turkman rulers in Western Iran made rival claims for kingship. In spite of political fragmentation, Timurid culture, uh, Timurid cultural hegemony was all pervasive in the visual arts and showed commonalities in artistic expression and the ornamental repertoire adorning manuscripts, ceramics, textiles, carpets, and the built environment. And while regional styles such as Shiraz, Baghdad, and Tabriz championed their own local variants, the perceived unity and prestige of the Timurid courtly style held an appeal beyond the, uh, beyond the empire's administrative boundaries. Arguably, it is this, the international Timurid style, that was the medium cross-fertilizing later courtly traditions including the Ottoman, the Safavid, and for a, brief, for a brief period, the Sultanates of India. So here's a representation uh, several centuries later of Amir Taimur uh, in the center, uh, seated here. And these are his descendants either side, Babur sitting here and Humayun. Uh, I show this because this is a hint as to the people I'll be talking about later. The continuing deterioration of Timurid territorial integrity meant that within the elapse of a century, the Commonwealth of Timurid princes, princes had dwindled to a few surviving outposts in Herat and Samarkand. Under pressure from the Uzbeks moving south from Central Asia and the Turkman Safavids expanding from Western Iran, Timurid Herat surrendered in 1507. But the story of the Timurid dynasty does not end here. Conventional histories, oops, sorry. Conventional histories of the Mughal dynasty ruling much of India, modern day Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Bangladesh also, have in the past tended to create the impression that the rulers emerged simultaneously at the Battle of Panipat in 1526. 
Indeed, at a superficial level, the very label Mughal entrenches in European historiography of India the idea of the dynasty's distinct identity without relation to earlier pedigree or ideological claim. The term Mughal, which has now stuck, is nothing but a misnomer and hides the fact that succeeding generations of rulers since the 16th century traced their dynastic origins and legitimacy to rule back to the same Amir Taimur Ghul Khan. As the last Timurid ruler of Samarkand, it was Babur and his success at the Battle of Panipat that marked the Timurid dynasty's transition, territorial transition from the Asiatic mainland to peninsular South Asia. If the Timurids and Mughals both share the same genealogical and ideological heritage, how did the transition to India influence the continued expression of the international Timurid style on the one hand, and on the other, the sartorial and textile culture of, court, uh, of the uh, Timurid court? To answer the first part of the question, uh, let us examine the international Timurid style uh, in a little more detail from its origins. Any analysis of the origins of an ornamental repertoire in early Islamic art, and I use that in quotation marks, Islamic art, I mean, there's nothing particularly Islamic about it, there's nothing theological about it, but it somehow lends to the uh, culture that, the visual culture that developed around the Islamic lands. The first major uh, adorned monument, the celebrated Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, which is attributed to the Umayyad Caliph Abdul Malik ibn Marwan uh, and completed around 687, uh, uh, almost six decades after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, is an important monument to start off with. Leaving aside the interesting form of the octagonal architecture itself, Original portions of gilt and colored mosaics uh, on both faces of the inner colonnade and outer colonnade encircling the rock contain the very elements of design that permanently characterize much of the non-figurative vocabulary of Islamic art. Specifically, calligraphy or khat, geometry or hansa, and arabesque or islimi. Whether it be fruiting vines and acanthus in a tight scroll, as we see in this, uh, in this section here, or seemingly winged, winged branches of trees studded with wrought jewels, as we see in this element here, uh, the qualities of symmetry, the balance between positive and negative space, and the abstraction of natural references are key features. Periodic re, uh, reinterpretations transforming the motifs of trees and vines into spear-shaped palmettes and split palmettes emerging from rocks, vases, and stylized collars extended uh, the vocabulary of a vigorously inventive repertoire for several centuries. But with the arrival of the Ilkhanids in the mid-13th century, this older arabesque tradition, developing fr uh, from a synthesis of late Sasanian and Byzantine classicism, where it is defined as Rumi, which is the Arabic word for Roman, now accommodated newer distinct forms of scrolling arabesque associated with China or Cathay, which is termed Khitai. So, Essentially, um, my point is that you've got two typologies of scrolling arabesque developing uh, with the changing of power. Familiar to us as the chinoiserie style, bold and elaborate peonies, lotus heads, multi-lobed foliage, knots, clouds, bat-like brackets, sinuous undulations of line, and gradations of bright colors further added to the familiar language of scrolling vines. The juxtaposition between the Rumi and Khitai styles of arabesque side by side created playful possibilities for compositions on the decorative page, woven or embroidered textiles, 
and even tile work, for example. The use of ornament on such embellished artifacts from the Timurid period reflects the settled resolution of earlier coarseness and exuberant tensions that occasionally surfaced in Ilkhanid productions. So here's uh, a horoscope for uh, one of the Timurid princes, uh, and this is in the Welcome Institute, and it shows, I think, some of the points uh, I'm trying to make about the tension between Khitai and Rumi Islimi. So this is Islimi, and this is in the Rumi style, where it, we're talking about spearhead-shaped split palmettes and palmettes. And then we talk about more uh, naturalistic, relatively speaking, uh, in an abstract fashion, more naturalistic floral um, uh, ornament, which you can see in these very narrow bands down here. But compared to the almost linear style of these uh, sections, uh, they, they, they are quite a different, they have quite a different uh, flavor and injection of energy. Um, I've got one more slide, which I've put in the wrong order. Uh, and this is from a British Library uh, manuscript for, for the same prince. Um, here we have, again, the Khitai form of ornament. And here we have the Rumi ornament. The trouble is that a lot of these terms are lost in the descriptive uh, literature of uh, uh, illuminated manuscripts. So uh, it, it doesn't always come through. But anyway, this is, the this is the kind of terminology that I've encountered in descriptive works from the period. The circulation of the product of Timurid court design was stimulated internally by regular ceremonials based on the exchange of gifts. External trade and diplomatic exchanges are also important means for exerting the linkage between soft power, design, and artifact. Following the dissolution of the Timurid Empire in Iran and Central Asia, the Safavids and Uzbeks benefited from territorial acquisition through the de facto possession of Timurid material in the form of architectural infrastructure, as well as personnel, that is, the artists, artisans, and administrators who maintained the constant supply of design and products for internal and external consumption. Thus, we find famous, uh, the famous Timurid painter Bihzad lauded under the Safavids, while the Nastaliq master calligrapher Mir Ali is taken as a captive by the Uzbeks, under whose regime he protests his servitude, forced to move between the cities of Herat, Samarkand, and Bukhara, but essentially carrying forward the tradition of the Timurids into the Uzbek school. For the Safavids and Uzbeks, the Timurid style was not so much international as it was local. The Ottomans ruling Anatolia, on the other hand, could not access the same resources in situ. Whatever they could glean in traded goods was bolstered in the midst of the Timurid Empire's fragmentation. Demands from the Safavids for manuscripts as booty after the Battle of Chaldiran in the summer of 1514 are well known. Other factors include the capture and voluntary migration of artists, administrators, former Timurid nobles, and scholars carrying with them their private libraries. This can also be seen in the westward movement of Herat's last Timurid ruler, Badi Uzaman Mirza, who fleeing the Uzbeks first sought sanctuary with the Safavid uh, ruler Shah Ismail at Tabriz. But when Tabriz fell to the Ottomans, he traveled to Istanbul with the surviving remnants of his manuscript library. The westward flow of such portable documentation comprising album, albums, scrapbooks, the technical manuals explaining and recording the range of Timurid design acumen could not but help to stimulate the extended 
period of experimental examination and synthesis over the course of the 15th century, constituting the transferable blueprints for the international Timurid style, the material recycled and rearranged, this material recycled and rearranged in later formats can today be seen in the dispersed corpus known under various labels, including the Siyah Qalam albums, the Dietz albums, the Baisunkur album, the Baba Naqash album, and the Topkapu Sarai album, uh, to name but a few sources. And here's um, a flavor of um, the kind of material that is contained in such albums. Uh, it, this is a, a folio from a Dietz album, which is in uh, Austria. By contrast, the precarious fortunes of Babur, whose territories were limited to the environs of Kabul at the time, prevented him from capitalizing on the misfortunes of his cousin Badi Ur Zaman Mirza on the fall of Herat. But that does not rule out the eastward flow of Timurid design acumen with portable objects, materials, manuscripts, and indeed Herati refugees recorded as having joined the prince. Unlike the Ottomans, whose libraries better preserved the diversity of the Timurid heritage uh, they were able to collect, we can still estimate the richness of libraries Babur and his connoisseur successors uh, assembled from a few of its illust uh, a few from it from a few of its illustrious manuscripts, which include um, a quintet for uh, she um, for uh, Amir Shir Ali Nawahi, uh, which is in the royal collection. The Shahnama of Muhammad Juki, was in the which is in the uh, Royal Asiatic Society. Um, the British Library's Bustan of Sa'di, uh, uh, the Garrett Zafarnama, uh, and many other manuscripts. So here is a leaf from uh, the British Library's Bustan, uh, showing some of the seals at the end of the manuscript, uh, indicating that it's a very popular work, and these works were not locked away in a cupboard. They were all to be examined, read, and enjoyed and also their cultural value somehow inflated their, their, their monetary value. Uh, so these manuscripts that survive are at the top, the cream of the library's collections, including the British libraries. However strained the Timurid dynasty's transition to India may have been, requiring as it did the assistance of Safavid rulers over two generations, and by that I mean uh, Shah Ismail and both, uh, uh, and also Shah Tahmas, uh, both helped uh, the Timurid rulers to reestablish themselves. The transition of the Timurid design acumen and appreciation of the hegemonic international Timurid style was far more assured and perennially revisited as sources for an ornamental repertoire. Coming to the second part of my original question, the transition to India can be said to have reformed the sartorial and textile culture at court to better reflect the adaptation of and adaption to local ethnic, cultural, environmental, and exotic influences over the centuries. The Timurid court maintained for at least over 200 years patterns of peripatetic movement as part of its system of government, living more often than not in opulent tents, just like their mool, and subject to the changeability of daily and seasonal weather. How the body is clothed, therefore, reflects seasonality and also formality and style in accordance with convention. With the exception of inscribed curtains, wall hangings, rugs, and occasionally tents, textiles are rarely dated, and their survival as, as intact garments is further limited by numerous factors. The calamities of war, looting, fire, flood, insect damage, 
are common causes for loss and destruction. To this, we can add the practice of burning garments annually for the retrieval of precious metals, the unpicking of metal studs, applique, fringes, beading, the redistribution of garments to members of the royal household and beyond, but also social prejudices relating to hygiene, the fear of bodily cross-contamination, the transference of bodily substance to garments feared to have been used mischievously in magic or at risk of, and therefore they all get destroyed, either buried or burnt. Contemporary historical records may comment on the significance of certain types of garments worn uh, or awarded at particular occasions. As images can, summa can summarize a thousand words, contemporary paintings may vividly capture the appearance of garments in the way text cannot, especially in the imperial chronicles and journals that are the Babur Nama, Akbar Nama, Jahangir Nama, Padshah Nama, and so on, as well as the imperial albums known today as the Salim album, Khurram album, the Gulshan Gulistan albums, the Kevokian Minto Wantage albums, the Nasiruddin Shah album, the late Shah Jahan album, etc. Lovely lists. Um, before, delivery, before delving uh, too deeply, however, the limitations of painted representations of men and women should be taken into consideration. Understanding circumstances influencing the representation of women, especially elite members of private domest of the private domestic sanctum and gendered spaces of the imperial andarun or harem is paramount for evaluating the accuracy of portraiture and attire. Most of the artists whose works end up in the, in the illustrated chronicles and albums I've just mentioned are men. And I do not think it too far-fetched to argue that the male gaze and, uh, and that, that the male gaze and women uh, of the imperial harem are two components that do not make for accurate portraiture. The projection of the male artistic imagination over the purported likenesses of identified or identifiable women is, I believe, problematic. Equally, just because the identity of the likeness best fits a particular scenario uh, mentioning, uh, mentioned in an inscription or historical passage, uh, it does not automatically follow that the likeness is wholly accurate as a portrait, no matter how believable it is. Um, so frequently we find in albums uh, attributions or ascriptions saying this is a portrait of Noor Jahan this is a portrait of Mumtaz, this is a portrait of Jahan Ara, famous figures in history, but nevertheless, would they have posed nude for certain portraits? You know, that's a question that we all need to ask. Um, we, I mean, do we, do we ask the same question about the uh, royal family posing nude today in certain magazines? So the same question would apply even to the mobile past. Um, it has been suggested that certain album paintings depict female members of the imperial family, which is a point I've just made. Uh, one example apparently shows the wife of Jafar Khan, a cousin of Muntaz Mahal, the consort of Emperor Shah Jahan. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a very attractive uh, image, but it's, is it a portrait? That's the question. Uh, here, just here, you find an inscription saying, Bibi Farzana. So if it's the same Bibi Farzana or Farzana Begum, the likeness gives the impression of being a closely observed portrait uh, until we look at another painting of Jafar Khan, her husband, embracing his consort, who should resemble the same Farzana Begum. Um, so this would be Farzana Begum by the context. She could be a concubine, but she should be Farzana Begum. Um, and is there a correspondence between the first likeness and this likeness? This does not say that this is Farzana Bibi, the previous one did, but is the inscription also reliable? You know, questions abound. 
paintings by women of the harem themselves are perhaps the sec uh, securest way of circumventing or subverting the male gaze. And yet the identity of the subject is not always indicated as systematically as we would like. Uh, and also we don't always have clear inscriptions uh, saying that this is the work of a certain lady. So here, for example, at the bottom it says, the work of Tulsi in the hand of Shah Jahan. Um, but we don't know about the identity of this sitter. Is this an imaginary work? Is this a portrait of a lady in the harem? Um, we have got past that idea that this is a project to, uh, a painted project for the titillation of men um, because it's produced by a woman. But I mean, does that really suspend those questions because it's in an album for all? men to enjoy. So um, these are just questions I pose. I don't think I can answer them perfectly. So these paintings are essentially rare and because they're so rare, I think um, evaluating them and evaluating their content is a difficulty for us. Thankfully, we do not need to rely on such paintings to understand the diversity of sartorial culture as other female functionaries and harem staff circulated around and within male spaces, bridging the gender divide under the mediation of eunuchs to guide and correct male artists on points of detail. Whether gender bias may, uh, where gender bias may not be a significant concern, paintings created specifically by the artists, uh, by the artist to demonstrate uh, creative, uh, the, his or her creative imagination and technical skill are yet another potential unreliable source. So uh, what I mean is that some paintings are created as bravura expressions of skill. Um, sometimes you'll have a textile garment, but full of a design that you think won't ever be worn. And certainly it won't fit in that way around the body. So clearly these kinds of uh, compositions are expressions of skill rather than being purely representational. So this is what I mean about um, the representation of women uh, in a courtly setting where you can see the divide between space. Here below, you have a male space, men uh, who are scientists, astrologers, astronomers, making their calculations, while here you have a nativity scene. So if a male artist is able to imagine this, we can take it at, simply at that level. But if this artist is saying that this is the actual portrait or arrangement of women in a particular scene at the nativity of such and such, that's where I think we have difficulty. But I think the detail that I want to draw your attention to is here, which is that certain women, especially senior women, women who are not threatened by the sexual charge of the male space, um, are able to move in and out and to mediate discussions, information between female and male space, private space, public space. As already glimpsed, the, arrange, uh, the range of clothes courtly women are depicted wearing falls mainly into three types. So I'll just reverse back. Um, firstly, the full length sleeved tunic or jama, narrowing at the waist and worn in conjunction with a tall hat. This is relatively close to the attire worn in earlier Timurid periods. So I'm talking about this kind of long sleeved tunic. It's almost like what we might call a maxi. Um, and it's worn with this tall hat here. This lady is also wearing a tall hat. I'm not sure if she's got uh, a full length jama on. The second is a bodice or choli, terminating above the stomach and a separate skirt or ghagra uh, extending from the waist down to the feet with a long scarf wound around the body and head. 
This appears to be an, earlier, uh, an early version of the modern day sari. Um, so we may find examples in this painting, but uh, there, there's, there's an example here. So your skirt here, the kagra, your choli, and then this orange diaphanous cloth is gathered in pleats at the front and then wound around the body and then taken over the head. Thirdly, a full length sleeved tunic with uh, an opening below the bodice called a peshvaz, worn with tight pajamas and usually with a headscarf draped over the shoulders. Um, so this lady here is wearing a peshvaz. So peshvaz means opening front or frontal opening, which is this um, large slit which comes from underneath the bodice. The bodice is a separate unit and the skirt is essentially stitched on separately. So it's not just one shirt or tunic and then it has this rent down the front. Um, and it's worn with a pajama and what she has is a scarf, which is a very slender indication of a scarf, but essentially the scarf is, is, is uh, uh, fulfilling the function that the sari is for this lady here. Um, but this is a slightly more suggestive image, so let's just leave it at that. The second and third types, that is these two, the uh, Kagra Choli uh, on, the, on the right and on the left the Peshvaz, the second and third types rely on the use of diaphanous materials and not much, uh, which is not much encountered in earlier Timurid usage. Only the Peshvaz permits the use of a brocaded waist sash or patka, the ends of which hang from the waist to the feet. So um, this is a unique form of patka that only uh, women um, have uh, as part of their clothing. And although I'm going to continue by talking about patkas now or waist sashes, um, I won't be talking about this particular type. This has a particular type of design that um, I think if I were to uh, go into, it would probably bog us down. But this gilt textile, this brocade, is what I call the patka, which is the waist sash. Men's attire differs somewhat in that the main tunic or jama terminates below the knee, opening either to the right or left side, tied with ribbons, and worn with tight pajamas akin to jodhpurs. Uh, we haven't got to that bit yet, but you'll see some examples later. Um, the jama uh, does not narrow at the waist, uh, unlike the peshvas. And the sorry, that wasn't me. Okay, and the peshvas, uh, sorry, does not narrow at the waist, and the skirt is not attached separately. The jama is brought together at the waist by the uh, by at least one patka knotted at the front. So there's no side knotting, uh, and it's not knotted at the back, it's all done at the front. Now, one at least, but sometimes two, occasionally three, and very seldom, but only for princes and kings, do you have a, a jeweled belt on top. In cases where the brocade patka is tied, an additional patka of white cotton is tied on top to prevent wear and tear to the brocade, which is normally a very fragile uh, material which can't take too much tension. While the, but, uh, uh, like the patka, turbans and caps are always worn in formal and public occasions. The absence of a turban indicates the lack of honor. So if you go out in public and you're not wearing your turban, um, there's a problem. And that applies also to the earlier Tiburid periods. So um, uh, it's not about profiles, side profiles, which is a point that is made by some art historians about Mughal uh, conventions for representation. You must have your turban on. If you don't have your turban on, whether you're shown frontally, three quarter or side profile, it doesn't matter. Like the uh, tie worn with the modern suit, the patka is the main item expressing the male wearer's personal taste. A signifier of wealth, 
the design of male patka sashes is an important arena for the experimentation and development of silk brocades in a manner unprecedented in earlier Timurid conventions. Then the ends of functional plain kamaban sashes were simply tucked in. In India, the ends were allowed to hang down and so, uh, uh, and so variations in the length and types of fabric or combinations of the different varieties of brocade created opportunities for sartorial self-expression. Let us turn now to explore the uh, extraordinary period in the reign of uh, the Emperor Jahangir. Uh, this is Jahangir. Uh, in, uh, extraordinary period in the reign of Jahangir, the great grandson of Babur, laying the foundations for changes in the ornamental repertoire that shifted later Timurid design away from the earlier international Timurid style, as we understand it. The Emperor, Jahangir, uh, the Emperor Jahangir's relations with his three sons uh, were a little odd, a combination of frustration and indulgence. The eldest, Prince Khosrow, was blinded and imprisoned after two failed rebellions just after his father's accession in 1605. The second eldest, Prince Parvez, had long been exiled to the fort of Ilahabad in disgrace since Khosrow's second rebellion. The third son, Prince Khurram, whom we know as Shah Jahan, this is Prince Khurram, it says here, Khurram Mirza, uh, this is a child, uh, a representation of the very youthful uh, Khurram, but it may not be a portrait, it may be a projection. The third son, Prince Khurram, who we know as Shah Jahan, ha uh, was the recipient uh, of many paternal favors and imperial largesse, seemingly by default, but also by dint of his abilities that were revealed when in the care of his grandfather, the Emperor Akbar. Akbar fostered Shah Jahan and his wife, uh, the childless Ruqayya Sultan Begum was his foster mother. Together they had uh, a very intimate circle uh, and when uh, Akbar was on his deathbed, Khurram wouldn't move away from his deathbed and uh, there's a great uh, discussion in some of Khurram's own histories of the affection he had for his grandfather over and above his own father. In fact, he didn't like his father much, which is not odd. <laughs> a diligent student of the arts, student uh, Shah Jahan quickly gained a reputation for the excellence of products created in his princely workshops and his taste in metalware, carved jades, crystals and jewels were applauded by Jahangir. As recompense for military campaigns against the Mevar Rajputs and the Deccan Sultanates of Ahmednagar, Golconda, Bijapur, Shah Jahan was eventually given possession of the uh, very uh, uh, artistically expressive state of Gujarat. Uh, where, uh, and this was given as his personal fief, so he could do whatever he liked in Gujarat. And this is in 1618, just at the time that the English ambassador, Sir Thomas Rowe, arrives. Uh, the only thing is that the two didn't get on. So we have a very, um, shall we say, negative impression left of Khosrow, sorry, Shah Jahan, uh, by Sir Thomas Rowe. Um, but nevertheless, um, it's an interesting time because uh, Gujarat was the center for brocade production in India. Shah Jahan's mind may have been diverted at the time that uh, Sir Thomas Rowe um, tried to transact with him, so that could be a reason why the two didn't get on. Uh, with the permission of his father, the prince was keen to establish a rapport with the Safavid ruler Shah Abbas whom he called Amu, uncle. Alongside letters written in elegant prose, the carved jades, rock crystal vessels, and jewels produced in his workshops, uh, which Shah Jahan selected personally, were sent in consignments along with Gujarati brocades as a means of stimulating demand. 
Now, if we remember that Shah Abbas is at this time already settled at Isfahan, and he has established the new quarter at New Julfa, where uh, Armenian communities are producing silk, silk products, and the trade of silk. So silk somehow becomes a way in which the two can communicate and exchange ideas artistically. Descriptions of the textiles are limited to official letters and chronicles, but even then, as I've already said, images can describe, it can cover a, a thousand words, and essentially we don't have that kind of detail in the text to justify um, uh, you know, very vivid descriptions. The succession of three missions between 1618 and 1622 dispatched consignments, uh, dispatching consignments of brocades uh, that were praised for their innovative and delicate designs and further complemented by Jahangir as surpassing in quality the variety of productions even in imperial workshops. So it was a big deal. Clues to the appearance of these fine brocades can be found in the portraits of Shah Jahan's associates and Jahangir himself, dating between 1618 and 1622, or slightly later. So um, a few paintings with a bit of a whirlwind indication of what these bakkas might have looked like. Um, so here's a very colorful representation of Shah Abbas. Um, this is Shah Abbas, the diminutive chap with dark skin, which is very odd because he's Iranian, who doesn't normally have dark skin, but nevertheless in this representation, by an Iranian, by the way, you know, Abul Hassan was an Iranian, um, and this is the gigantic Jahangir peering over him. Uh, so the patka, now we have two patkas. This is the brocaded type made in Gujarat, uh, based on polychrome silk and gold, and this is something called ban bandhej, which is uh, a form of tie-dyed uh, cotton or silk, but probably here we have silk. Here is another example of the same kind of language of, uh, if, we, if we return here, um, you see these brackets here along the edges, these interchanging brackets. And the same kind of interchanging brackets occur here, which means that there is a certain typology that is being developed in these paintings. Uh, so in this painting, Jahangir, not so large this time, except he is standing on top of the globe uh, showing peace. Uh, and right at the very bottom, we have representation of an Indic figure called Manu, who um, uh, is uh, the, almost like the primordial man, uh, Adam. And what Jahangir is doing, he is shooting Dalidra. Dalidra is a representation of poverty in uh, uh, who is normally uh, eschewed at Dosera which is uh, one of the uh, major Hindu festivals. Here is an image sometimes called a representation of Prince Salim, sometimes called a representation of Prince Khurram. There's no ascription, only the name of the artist, Bichitr. So you can make of this whoever you like. But here you have on his shoulders a Gujarati bandhej, and here you have uh, a Gujarati uh, brocade. Um, again, bright colors. Sometimes there is a variation between the kind of uh, ornament that is on here. Um, some of it does relate back to the international Timurid style. Uh, so that's the point that I'm trying to make, that here's the typology again. And this is a representation of one of Shah Jahan's most important associates, uh, or the Rai Rayan who gets the title of Raja Vikramajit. Now he uh, is executed by Jahangir in 1622. So this portrait could not have been made any later than that. Uh, and the title is written here on the side, Shabihe Raja Vikramajit. It resembles Jahangir's handwriting. Can't be too sure, but it resembles Jahangir's handwriting. So if that is the case, this is made at a time when uh, Raja Vikramajit is in favor. He's wearing, again, another one of those uh, brocaded 
uh, badkas, on top of which is a plain white cotton badka. So if you remember, I said these uh, brocades are rather fragile. You don't really want them to be taking the full weight of your stomach, breathing in and out, heaving, etc. So the white badka is there to take the force. Consisting of single and group portraits where the, peculiar, uh, where the peculiarities of the brocade uh, patka are clearly displayed, uh, showing polychrome silk and gold thread, highly classicized floral scroll, uh, divided into cells or elongated cartouches, or combining cusped interchange designs along vertical edges. So that's essentially my summary of what these uh, patka motifs or designs are like. Bandhej, or polychrome tie-dyed cotton or silk fabrics with geometric patterns were previously highly prized under emperors Akbar and Jahangir, who made a point of wearing them as patka sashes in combination with other brocades. In the midst of the fashion for Shah Jahan's newer, more opulent Gujarati patkas, Bandhej appears to have become somewhat downgraded. So occasionally you'll find that women of the harem who are maids and not the elite ladies uh, sitting on golden thrones are wearing Bandhej. Sometimes you find servants who are merely picking up clothes from the floor or laying out the bed sheets are shown wearing Bandhej, but no longer are princes shown wearing bandhej, sometimes Shah Jahan, who you'd expect would be wearing bandhej, being the fief holder of Gujarat, he doesn't wear bandhej. So there is something that's going on between the two types of patka types, bandhej and brocade. Just as Prince Shah Jahan uh, and his influence at court is reaching its apex, Jahangir's health began to decline. In, uh, dependent on um, addictive substances like alcohol and opiates uh, since his adolescence, respiratory complications and later mental instability meant that physicians encouraged Jahangir to move to cooler climes in order to avoid the fate that befell both his younger brothers, Daniel and Shah Murad, both of whom died of alcoholism. The late uh, uh, 1610s and 1620s were thus dominated by the ailing emperor's frequent visits to the northern provinces of Kabul, Lahore, and Kashmir. Both Lahore and Kashmir especially attracted Jahangir's uh, attention, which resulted in the remodeling of Lahore Fort and Kashmir was subject to the creation of the Shalamar Bagh, a formal garden divided into terraces. Although Jahangir patronized these projects, he deputed his trusted son, Shah Jahan, to complete the structures with the same finesse and design acumen displayed in the objects produced in his workshop. At the same time, both father and son were transfixed by the beauty of Kashmir's varied blossoms, uh, peonies, crocuses, and other plants that resulted in a number of plant studies for incorporation into albums. So this is the point at which I think I'm trying to suggest Floromania begins. The, name, uh, the need to furnish the newly completed palace in Lahore Fort and the Kashmir Gardens uh, with carpets, cushions, hangings, uh, other, bolster, uh, other upholstered fittings forced artisans of the imperial workshop to reconsider their established patterns of asymmetrical, figurative, and abstract Rumi and Khitai floral arabesques in carpet design, for example, and to begin incorporating elements of the floral studies inspired by Kashmir's diverse plants and blossoms. Such changes do not find their way into the Gujarati brocade, um, uh, the brocaded patkas, however, 
as the emerging imperial taste for Florimania was uh, initially confined to artisans of the Lahore Kashmir axis. So there is a geographical bias developing here. Um, so, oh gosh, yes, here we have another image of uh, the same Patka dichotomy, uh, but perhaps in a slightly more simplified style. Right, okay, so here we have an example of a carpet made most likely in the late Akbari style, where you have almost like a free-for-all of animals of the hunt, uh, Indian uh, flora and fauna, uh, specifically Indian, you have lots of tigers, you have lots of gazelles, nilgai, and uh, other animals that are specific to India. You have peacocks, you have also these very um, prominent uh, palm trees. And you don't find that in the Iranian or Timurid repertoire, so this is a very uh, distinct form. Uh, you have in the cartouches here, uh, Khitai and Rumi forms of ornament. So there is a juxtaposition between the main field and what is in the borders. So this is what existed before. And then suddenly you have gradual incorporations of naturalistic florals. So this is a field, the main field is taken up by Khitai style uh, arabesque with large floral heads in a stylized um, uh, side profile, not front on, but side profile. In the center of these little units, you have naturalistic florals suddenly emerging. In the borders, you have these almost symmetrical, but that's to be, um, that's to be you know, taken on, on as a developmental style uh, element, but these Florals uh, show that they are sprouting from a ground, that they have small leaves, large leaves, that they're not symmetrical. They don't have necessarily a central axis that overrules their natural form. Um, so that's an incremental or intermediate style. Then you have full-blown uh, florals, and there is a comparative example even in the exhibition. Uh, so I'd like you to you know, try and pay attention for, um, I mean, this is a carpet, but the uh, uh, example that's in the exhibition is uh, a very nicely made embroidery. In 1622, Shah Jahan is declared a rebel uh, due to prince, uh, palace intrigue and any interest the prince had in the further development of the naturalistic floral style in textiles and especially in Gujarat, in his Gujarati workshops, specializing in polychromatic brocades, had to wait until the rapprochement, uh, uh, until a rapprochement could be arranged. But there was no rapprochement, and just as the prince thought he would join his uncle Shah Abbas, exiled in Iran, news broke of Jahangir's death. How convenient! After six months, Shah Jahan cautiously approached the capital at Agra, where he ascended the throne. The early years of his rule were particularly unstable, being marked by several invasions, rebellions, famines, uh, uh, and also tinged with personal tragedies, including the death of several infants and his beloved wife, Mumtaz. The impact of the latter event reverberated throughout the state for several years with many austerities. A more celebratory uh, change of mood came with the occasions of the marriages of uh, Shah Jahan's two eldest sons, Dara Shoko and Shah Jahan, uh, sorry, Shah Jahan, Shah Shuja, uh, which came in rapid succession. Uh, accompanied with the full pomp and splendor of the state. So the state had been essentially saving up its resources and essentially let out a lot of steam by um, the production uh, and uh, gift giving of brocades and very fine uh, products that Dara Shukul was very proud of because he also took a great interest in brocades. Um, and there are passages in the Pachanama where Dara Shukul is discussing 
with Shah Jahan, certain policies on brocades. So we mustn't rule out the importance of texts. Following this, the emperor made a visit to Kashmir via Lahore to revisit some of the sights and sounds that he once enjoyed as a prince. The exercise rekindles with great intensity the earlier interest in Florimania. Recorded in great detail uh, in the Regnal Chronicle, the Pacha Nama, which devotes folio after folio to the effusive observation of Shah Jahan's passionate admiration for the flowers of Kashmir, his preferences and uh, his preferences for certain flowers and the replant, replanting of certain flowers, um, as well as memories of happier times with his father and also his wife. Although Jahangir's exploration of natural phenomena has already been uh, studied several times, Shah Jahan's interest always has a story attached, either a significant personal reminiscence or else an interesting historical anecdote. Shah Jahan's expedition to, uh, to Kashmir fell in the seventh regnal year. Further visits to, uh, to Kabul uh, broadened his horticultural interest into the dynastic and ideological potential for such subjects through a deeper study of Babur's policies as a gardener and patron of gardens. Unlike his visits with Jahangir, when Shah Jahan lacked, uh, uh, when, when Shah Jahan lacked the time uh, and access to his workshops to build on the naturalistic discoveries by reforming the output of the silk workshops, uh, and I'm talking about the Gujarati brocades again, now the emperor was keen to reform the ornamental repertoire if not wholly transitioning from the Rumi and Kitai arabesque ornament, then to change elements like floral heads and buds uh, so that it could better emphasize, he could better emphasize naturalism in design. So previously where we saw arabesques with abstract peony heads, lotus heads, now we see naturalistic peonies, we see naturalistic roses, irises, poppies, tulips, and other types of blossoms that are distinct in their profile and have also coloristic properties. Looking at the brocaded butkas for men, the enlargement of end panels with a plain gold, brown, uh, gold ground forces the eye to focus on the, tree, uh, on the repeated plant motif across the horizontal plane. So this is the kind of thing I'm going to show you. Um, uh, white dodami muslin, embroidered with either gold and uh, colored thread, now became ever more coloristic and uh, with floral, uh, free floral borders. Brocaded robes of honor or hilots uh, exhibit the switch to ever larger and complex floral motifs repeated across the ground, such as in this painting of the, res uh, the reception of uh, uh, Ali Mardan Khan, who was the governor, the Safavid governor of Kandahar, who defected to Shah Jahan's court in the 11th uh, regnal year. So we have here uh, Shah Jahan seated on a high dais. Uh, this is Lahore Fort, by the way. Um, and here you have the scene for the ambassadors, sorry, not the ambassador, Ali, Ali Mardan Khan's uh, arrival. He brings here his tribute of horses and many other jewels. That's a detail of Shah Jahan seated above. Now, this is the khil'at. This is part of a sarafa, which means a head-to-toe treatment of gilded brocade robes, gilded brocade or partly gilded brocade, turban sashes, waist sashes, shoes, boots, belts, everything that a gentleman would need for his ennoblement or to show his promotion. And what we have is suddenly 
large florals being shown on a gold ground for chilets. And this pattern continues. Oh, by the way, this chap here is wearing what you call a dodami. A dodami muslin is a very fine muslin, but with very delicate gilt embroidery, sometimes picked out with colors. It's not based on silk, that's the main difference. But it is the dodami technology that feeds into the Deccani technology of uh, kalamkari and also chintz making and all of these other things. They are using print technologies, whereas here it is being woven into the muslin. So there is a switch at a later stage, but anyway, that's another point. Right, here is Shah Jahan seated on a, uh, a seat, not a throne, a, a seat, uh, and he's honoring Dara Shukur, his eldest son, who is wearing another one of these extremely embellished brocades with large florals. A wonderful thing about this image is you see what I mean about the patka design. Okay, so these brocades now develop on the end portions of the hanging patka, large panels. These panels have a golden ground, a plain golden ground, and on that plain golden ground, then you have these super enlarged floral designs, repeated florals, the same floral normally, not, not alternating uh, plants, so that essentially the naturalism of the, uh, the, the depicted plant can be captured and the base unit, which is essentially the width of the, um, the thread, is what determines both the amount of detail you can cram into that space and also the size or the, the height of the gilt panel. Now, the gilt panel is repeated on either side of the sash and then in the intermediate space you have something that essentially allows the uh, textile to be tied without an additional uh, white patka on top. So you see the use of single patkas, not double patkas. We have seen something like this naturalism before. At the court of Sultan Suleiman Khan, we see the emergence of a style of asymmetrical floral ornament called the Shugufa style, further developed by the painter illuminator called Karamemi, decorator of the Divan e Muhibbi, for example. Unlike Mughal uh, album borders or illuminated manuscript borders, it's, uh, the, uh, the, the orientation of the ground is not resolved in these leaves, uh, which is made around the mid 16th century in um, Ottoman Anatolia for uh, 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 the royal patron, probably the Sultan himself. And here we have one which shows that these flowers, naturalistic because they are not trying to be symmetrical, they are trying to depict uh, real floral types, but still abstracted to a certain level. Um, and their ground is always orientated downwards. So on this page, you see the florals all arranged with their um, sprouting base at the bottom. Here, however, you find that the ground is the frame, the jadbal of the text. So this kind of convention for naturalism is not always resolved in earlier phases. But my point is that it does occur, but it doesn't influence what we encounter in India. The naturalistic floral style that emerged under Shah Jahan, on the other hand, was far more enduring than Karamemi's as part of an ornamental repertoire revolution. One that in many ways supplanted the vocabulary of motifs that constitute the international Timurid style in later periods. I would argue that this is not Shah Jahan's intention, preferring merely to supplement and extend the international Timurid style's ornamental repertoire with naturalistic florals mixed in with the Khitai and, uh, and Rumi Islimi, 
However, later generations are the ones who interpreted the simple unit of a flower repeated across a base, a grid, within a matrix, all sorts of interpretations that moved on from the Shah Jahani heritage. And yet, the association, the association with Shah Jahan was maintained. I conclude by returning to the question I raised at the very beginning about synergies across arts. If we look at the artistic administration of earlier Timurids, especially Prince Baisunkur, the son of Shahrukh, unity of style was a policy that grew out of the activities and uh, capacity of the scriptorium to support the design of most fields of material culture. Under Shah Jahan, the naturalistic floral style was one of several modes of embellishment coexisting in parallel. I think I should leave it there. I thought I would end on a slightly provocative image, having, you know, having already discussed this. Well, that was wonderful. Thank you very much indeed, Saki. All kinds of questions, but I know people in the audience will have two. We do have time for a few questions. Would somebody like to ask a question? Would you, would you like me to come over there? Straight. Would you like me to come over there, or shall I just answer them from here? No, no, no. <laughs> See if anybody asks a question ah, first. <laughs> yes, the lady over there, yes. Arabic letters is written in what language, please? Sorry. Arabic letters. Arabic letters? Yes, it's written in what language? Where? Sorry, what? Language. Is it Arabic, Turkish, Indian? What language is used? The Arabic in India, language. you mean? In the pictures. Oh, here, this, this specifically. Yeah. Oh, this is in Persian. Uh, I see. There was other things, and there was always some Arabic letters said something but i don't know obviously what okay so what are you referring to a particular a particular image several uh, one of them uh, at the beginning i think there was uh, arabic letters uh -huh. right at the top you know most of the pictures include some arabic letters okay it might it might take us a while to were. actually go all the way back at the beginning i think there were quite a lot <laughs> oh Thank gosh you. sorry <laughs> um well enjoy it <laughs> Um, have I gone past it? Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, back, back one. This one. Okay, all right, yes, so this is a Persian verse. Please don't ask me to read it. <laughs> this is a Persian verse. Something to do with Chunan Kedad Nazari Dar Sifat Namiyai. In my, uh, uh, as in my eye, your uh, reputation does not come. Okay, minnat et vassuf chiguyam to khud dar ayi, sorry, to khud dar ayi nebin. How can I, um, how can I praise thee? Uh, why don't you come into the mirror yourself? Chunin daracht naravid, I hope I've got this right, because the dots are not always there. Chunin daracht naravid, Pay, uh, pay, no, bebustan iram, chunin sanam nabu, nabud, or could be nubavad, nabubad, dar nigar khane chin. Right, okay, so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, right, okay, so the last line is they, they cannot be uh, such a statue or, you know, the, the beloved, in the Gallery of China. So the Gallery of China, Karkhani Chin, or um, even Factory of China? Yes. Chinese Factory, yes, okay, right. <laughs> Have I got that right, Hazur? <laughs> okay. Uh, are, are there any more questions? Yes? <laughs> That's a brilliant talk, one of the best I've had. Uh, if I were, now if I'm right, he wrote his autobiography, the Book of the Tiger, which is considered now a classic work of Islamic literature. 
Am I right in thinking that was a new venture for Islam until then, that no major autobiography, major figure, Bible is Book of the Tiger, the first Muggle Emperor? Uh, can somebody just interpret that? <laughs> Sorry. The, the oh, just repeat, tiger. please, could you just repeat that? And, um... The Book of the Tiger, that's his work. His the Book of the Tiger, sorry. No, the Bible wrote a book called The Book of the Tiger, his autobiography. Oh, you're talking about uh, the, the first Barke Barke Arte Barbary, the yes. Barbaranama, yeah? Yes. Now, he, he wrote this book. A lot of people said that was the first autobiography in the Muslim world, a new venture of Islam. Am I mm -hmm. right in saying that? Uh, it is certainly the case in Turkish literature. There are uh, fragments of... Um, earlier autobiographical journals in Arabic literature, and you go all the way back to the Seljuk period. Unfortunately, because most students of Persian don't read Arabic, they would tend to ignore that point. And since the Babur Nam or Vake Ate Babri, which is the, Arab, uh, the uh, title for the Turkish text, um, uh, has been translated into Persians. Persians, of course, think that they have total command of this literature. So, um, yes and no. It is the earliest autobiographical uh, text in Turkish. It is also a major autobiographical text in Persian through translation, but it's not the earliest ever in Islamic literature. <laughs> right. <laughs> Are there any further questions? Yes, over there. Mm. Um, this is a, a rather naive comment. It's an observation in Gujarat in 1982 uh, that the flower of Enya is still continuing um, uh, in uh, a figure of apparently nomadic people of the Enns. The men uh, had what appeared to me then to be very broad skirts, such as the, uh, uh, the sort you show, with huge roses. Wonderful! You should have collected their 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 garments and paid them a lot because I mean these these uh, you know these fragments of older textiles are so rare. That's why I haven't actually included any of the fragments that I know because they're so decrepit. And if you saw them being worn and used, oh how how glorious! Um, I wish I owned them because. Uh, they're, they're like gold dust, quite literally. They're even more valuable to me than gold. Um, there was a project also for the reinvention of, or the, the experiment to reinvent or understand what the technique is for the development of these brocaded patkas um, called Minakari, which was exhibited at the British Museum, I think, more than a decade ago, probably 15 years ago or something like that. And I think it was to show that there is a continuing tradition. However, there is a discontinuity in the technology behind the tradition. There's an appreciation of this kind of floral mania um, of all types, whether it's large flowers or tiny, tiny flowers repeated in, in a matrix, um, in many aspects of even contemporary um, clothing design, you know, in, the, in the, what you might call the sort of pseudo-classical style of Bollywood, for example, um, maintains the same kind of um, appreciation of uh, floral mania. The only thing is that they're not able to appreciate sometimes that those who, um, those figures in history who pre-existed uh, Jahangir or Shah Jahan may not have had the same kind of floral mania designs on their clothes. So sometimes you have inaccur uh, inaccuracies. Anyway, that's just by the by. Are there any more questions? And Yes, I think that this has to be the last Hello. one. Ah, thanks for your talk. The, uh, the libraries of the Timurid uh, intellectuals, when they left to travel to parts Western, why were they so valued by the countries they were going into? Manuscripts generally, especially when they're very fine manuscripts, illustrated manuscripts, calligraphic manuscripts made on very fine quality materials like paper and with elaborate bindings, etc., always fetch uh, a large amount 
in book markets. So let us, leaving aside the issue of it having any Timurid connection, royal connection, or even the um, product of a private household, um, it would still be valued as an important or refined item. So even at the British Library, when we encounter a refined manuscript and we still don't know who the patron is, we still value it because uh, its materials simply sing or speak to us about quality. Uh, however, um, when the Timurids moved into India and they were disconnected with their um, previous heritage, cities of Samarkand, Herat, etc., and they had this great feeling, it's a romantic feeling, but they had this great feeling for, oh, my heritage is, and they would go on about what their heritage was, and they would define it through portable objects. Manuscripts were some of the most important portable objects alongside jewels, alongside textiles of some, of some types, um, uh, jades, other things that somehow encapsulated that quality um, with the Timurids, I think, or moguls, they overinflated perhaps the price. So the same price would, might not have been given by a Safavid or an Uzbek for the same manuscript. Um, but certainly the Timurids of India did. Okay, I don't think they would display, displayed, I mean, you know, sort of put onto some kind of book stand and then, oh yeah, the, certainly the illustrations said a lot about clothing, about society, about the arrangement of space, where women sat in relation to men, especially in the Quril Tai or the Toi, you know, which are the celebrations, the, the ritual celebrations of the Timurid court. Quril Tai, okay, I think we're going a lot, uh, a lot further back, but you know, it's, uh, it shows, these illustrations in manuscripts show how uh, life in the earlier Timurid period may have been slightly different in pattern to what the Timurids had become accustomed to in India. And especially by the time you get to the 19th century, there's a huge transformation in the way in which uh, Timurid courts under, shall we say, Shah Alam, uh, Akbar II, Bahadur Shah II, uh, uh, were confined to these little spaces within palaces, always under guard. Um, they, they, they yearned for the peripatetic life where they're able to roam, they're able to go out for hunting, able to enjoy what they call Yilak and Kashlak, which is the summer meadow and the winter meadow. They're not able to do that, so they pine for these kinds of social patterns uh, of behavior, of existence. Uh, so do I. Right, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that was fascinating. I'd like to thank Dr. Barbary again for a most stimulating evening and to ask if you would like to join us for tea and coffee in the foyer where we can continue this discussion. Thank you so much. By the way, <laughs> next week, Monday, is going to be no ruse, so happy no ruse to everyone. Thank you. <laughs>